routed to him to answer. And we will get the man himself to answer your question. Welcome to Weaving a Better Future. I'm Daniel Mossi, Global Economics Writer for Bloomberg View. We have a great panel. I'll introduce them in a moment. First of all, let's talk about what we're actually talking about today. We're talking about textiles in India. Textile industry accounts for 4% of gross domestic product, 15% of exports. Pretty impressive. It's a big employer as well. But is there more to be done? We heard a lot yesterday about scale and about the need to bulk up exports. So why don't I introduce our panel? First up, we have, let's introduce Vani Irani, Minister for Textiles, Minister for Information and Broadcasting. Minister, afterwards, you'll have to tell me how those portfolios stitch together. <laughs> Uh, Neelan Shiva is the Managing Director of Industry Mother Earth. Dipali Goenka is the CEO, Joint Managing Director of Wellspun. And William Bissell is the Managing Director of Fab India Overseas. I'm going to ask each of our guests to talk for a few minutes, talk about what's on their mind, and then we'll kick the discussion off. So, Neelan, yes, why don't you go ahead? Great. Yeah. So I'm here, I am, I, was, I am a Schwab social entrepreneur, 2011. Building an ecosystem for inclusive growth in the country. Yeah, India is one of the largest, fastest growing economies in the world, but we need to be more inclusive, right? And um, that's where I would come from. I think scale in this country is essential. We cannot do anything in this country without scalability. Uh, we have, I think, uh, we are poised at a point in time where everybody is really upbeat. Uh, in, in the next three to five years, we're going to see a major transformation in the country. But are we going to be able to take everybody along? Yeah? We've had five years of a wonderful skill mission, genuinely well-planned, well-worked, but it's resulted in 12% of employment. Yeah? India cannot look to any other country in the world for a model. So China could achieve the MDGs, uh, helped achieve the MDGs through mass migration. Yeah? Indians are not migrating for work. So we have to look at solutions. In the textile sector, we have, I see a 60 million rural artisanal producers, textile workers. Uh, I was with uh, the Munjal uh, yesterday, uh, Sunil Munjal. He said Neelam is 140 million. And it's very, very heartening to see how large senior leadership in corporate India, senior leadership in the Indian government is really looking at this labor force now. Uh, we were with Lian Fung yesterday, $20 billion of global sales, saying that in the next 10 years, the customer will dictate purchase. There is going to be a need for more and more decentralized, disaggregated production. And he said, he said, India is sitting on that. Yeah? So India needs to build big plants. India needs to build large businesses. At the same time, India can look at decentralized, distributed manufacturing models, which are going to be very required in the future. Customers are going to want it. Yeah? So on that note, I'll stop. And thanks a lot. Thank you for keeping a brief to Pali. You know, taking it from Neelam's uh, perspective, um, I would say that when you're talking about uh, what is close and what is the agenda that we talk about today, I think for us, it would be gender diversity, social inclusion, natural resources, and sustainability. And I think these would be the things that can drive India to a future where you're talking about not only that 1.2 billion population, but the youngest population in the world. So, and how, how would we talk about uh, skilling and multi-skilling them from the bottom of the pyramid to upper, because that's what is India's strength and that's what the world is looking at. And if textiles, if I talk about from our perspective, I think it weaves the thread from the communities around where we, we, we work to the markets that we, uh, we supply to. I think it's a very uh, very integrated chain that we talk about. 
And um, I think the interesting key thing, we are at Wellspun, we employ around 20% women at, um, at, the, uh, at the level that we talk about, uh, at the blue collar, 40% in the senior leadership. And I must say, and I'm really proud to announce it today, that uh, just a week back, we started a cut and sue center employing around 1,000 girls. The security is a woman, the, uh, the driver is a woman, and it is run primarily by women forces. Apart from that, as we work in the communities across Anjar, we, we actually have these women who actually had left their whole craft ability to deploy them, translate that craft into selling it to uh, the various markets. Hence, uh, adult literacy being the key, and their children go to school. There are stories like Avni, who from you know, Anjar to Arkansas spoke about her story, and which created in several aspirations of several Avnis at the, at the backyards of her country. So I, I would say that, you know, um, uh, and uh, as you said yesterday, as you said, why would India need textiles? And why would India be, uh, what about te textiles is the thread that will employ the people. And if we talk about a, a company like us, I mean, when we talk about, and, and for us, we would be one of the largest in the complete vertically integrated plant. The advantage that we have, that we weave the social thread together, apart from creating the complete blockchain management from cradle to the point of sales, to the data analytics, from the back end to the front end to, um, to employing people across. I think um, there's a lot to be done. And you also have a woman CEO. <laughs> William. Um, thank you, Dan, Honorable Minister. Um, I think we are at a very exciting point in our journey. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has laid out a very ambitious vision of creating five crore jobs by 2020 in his bid to transform the country. And I think it's something that, as, uh, as a business leader, we all really have been inspired by that vision, because uh, this is the number of people that will be entering the workforce in the next four years. So what the challenge that the prime minister has set for the country and for the business leaders in the country and the entrepreneurs in the country is that all the people joining the workforce should find a job. And I think this is probably one of the greatest challenges ever been set. And I think that um, it's a comment upon everybody, in, in all of us, to think about how we can best address that. And uh, we have, as a small gesture towards that, we have said that we are going to take the number of people we directly and indirectly employ from 55,000 to 200,000. So I know it's a small step, but it's a small contribution. But I think the Honorable Prime Minister's vision of uh, five crore jobs is really what is needed because that employment will transform every other aspect in the country. And I think that uh, we're very fortunate here to have the Honorable Minister of Textiles here because textiles are the growth driver. And if, if five crore jobs need to be produced um, and sustainable employment needs to be created by 2020, then textiles, the Ministry of Textiles is going to have to play a lead role in that. And one of the initiatives uh, which has personally benefited us greatly is the Handloom Mark, because for the first time, the Ministry of Textiles has backed the mark so that consumers across the country know when they're buying genuine Handloom product. And I think that the, India's greatest wealth is its cultural heritage, and its cultural assets are today the most under-leveraged of any country in the world. You look at any small European country, if they make one champagne or they make one thing, they tout it all over the world. And they have delegations, they protect their mark, they don't allow other people to use it. We have tens of thousands of cultural assets in the country. And if each one of them, if each of department of the government was to look at protecting those cultural marks, the way the Ministry of Textiles has protected the handloom mark, then I think that in itself could take the economy in a long way towards creating those five crore jobs. And I think it's a very exciting time. I'm, if someone asked me where would you want to be in the world at this time, I would say the best place to be is in India at the moment as we undergo this transformation. Absolutely. Well, Minister, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> I think that um, I couldn't have spoken more eloquently for the textile industry as the three panelists have done so this morning. 
Um, textiles is the second largest employer in the country after agriculture. We have an opportunity to leverage not only our legacy, as Mr. Vizal has said, but also a structure which not only generates employment, but also creates new entrepreneurs. What are the kind of entrepreneurs that we can create? Some who are focused only on exports, some who love the legacy so much that they would rather work at the grassroots, some who are trying to venture into the fields of technical um, textiles. Um, I have seen how much of a difference does a huge investment of a composite structure makes uh, to an area which is struggling uh, from socioeconomic challenges, for instance. Uh, Ms. Goenka's company, it came into a, a place in Gujarat right after the Gujarat earthquake aftermath with absolutely nobody wanting to invest. They took that one step uh, not only for enlarging their own capacity, but also because I believe somewhere they thought that they could contribute to the resurrection of a community that was genuinely rendered homeless, genuinely rendered um, you know, without any jobs, or for that matter, any hope. And now to see a flourishing textile corporate uh, there uh, in the backyards of Gujarat, to see them in an area which uh, people said logistically would be a nightmare, and to convert that challenge into an opportunity generally speaks about the potential of textiles. The fact that you can have a composite mill, but if the ownership wants to, it can dedicate itself to engaging with the local craft, the local legacy. If the ownership wants to, it can provide examples to the leadership in the corporate world with regards to empowerment of women. If the ownership wants to, it can take you know, those tiny things about the legacy, the culture within that particular area and bring it to not only the national forefront, but also create an international market for it. I think that's the beauty of Indian textiles, that it's not a story which can be said in one particular silo. It is a story that engulfs the entire country, not only culturally, but also economically. Well, Minister, let me challenge you gently on that. As your, you no. can challenge me as strongly as you like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known in India not to mince words. <laughs> Maybe we should imitate questions. <laughs> you know, um, the World Economic Forum publishes a table of the world's largest economies. We know India's in the G20. What I didn't quite realise until I examined this was how quickly India is closing in on the position occupied by some of the Western economies. You're now top 10, you're closing in on France. You're only a couple of tenths of a percentage point away from France. Again, why isn't the future services? Why isn't it tech? Why isn't it upscale manufacturing? Why are textiles so important? I doubt I would hear a French minister espouse textiles the way you I think textiles embodies all the other range of activities that you have just now enunciated. And that is the beauty of textiles. Today, if we talk about expansion of the sector, we talk about expansion of retail opportunities, and that is where the services sector comes in. And you have more and more youngsters employed in that one particular division. When you talk about technology, uh, today we are very proud that at one end we have Neelam talking about the handcrafted goods, but at the other end, uh, the textile industry collaborates that comfortably, even with space technology and from a perspective of carbon fiber. Today, when you talk about, let's say, not only services, but from an international exposure uh, perspective, I can uh, hear, uh, you know, be a banner person for the Pali and talk about that the towels you use at Wimbledon, they're made right there in Gujarat. So those are the stories that we can tell very proudly the challenge has been that those stories were not told before. They are being told now, and that is why a it's question... It's really telling those stories, and the reason I ask is, here is the business section of last Sunday's New York Times Minister. You may have seen it, but on the front page below the fold, IBM makes a big bet on India, and it spills over to the inside page. Is the message about textiles in India getting out beyond India's borders. Many people think India's about tech, it's about Hyderabad, it's about Bangalore and IBM. I think that uh, we should have done had you over 
for mm -hmm. our Textiles India 2017 yeah. summit. Yeah. We had I'll over 104. I'll be there next yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. We had 104 yeah. countries yeah. participate, yeah. and only in two days, mm -hmm. we had uh, MOUs and B2B yeah. exchanges worth 11,000 crores, and we had business deals right there on that uh, symposium during those exchanges were 2200 crores, which uh, was a first for India. India had uh, a predominant challenge where people from our country, uh, irrespective whether they're in the handcraft opportunity or in the made up sector or in the apparel sector, they had to take their ways and go to 120 destinations across the world. And for the first time under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, we said, let the world come and see India's potential. There were many naysayers. They said, it's not possible. You just have a one, one and a half hour month window. But the world did come. And 104 countries ended up doing businesses uh, with our people. And I think uh, maybe uh, next time we will invite somebody from New York Times to cover that. <laughs> <laughs> invite but the, I guess invite the text Bloomberg first. I, I think, I think, no, Bloomberg was there. But yeah. I think that, I think the strength of textiles has been, it's always that silent tiger that roars, but very, very uh, nicely and gently. But whenever uh, the potential needs to be exercised, it's right out there in the front. Okay, Dipali's looking like she wants to roar, but let me just cue this <laughs> up. We chatted before the session began about the Bangladesh free trade agreement with the EU. So let me just frame it differently. Who's eating your lunch? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I'll tell you one thing. It's in our control. A lot of things are in our control to make that difference. But yes, the free trade agreement is definitely one key, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, thing that impacts us. That is, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the countries like that definitely have an advantage in the um, in uh, in the European perspective and uh, the Canadian perspective. Um, but despite that, um, I would say that you know, if if you have uh, a portfolio and a product range that is far bigger and better than uh, than your counterparts. Because if I if I talk about uh, you know the India has an opportunity to play in the innovative perspective, has an opportunity to play in the medium scale to the upper upper price points, whereas the other countries start from the opening price points and end there. So for, uh, for you know it made us far more. It, it it challenged us, but it also challenged us to create a kind of a portfolio of 27 strong patents, and out of that, 10 patents already being granted to us as a company itself. And so, so is a lot of other uh, you know, companies doing that. So um, I would say we make our lunch and eat it too. Okay. <laughs> you know, William, um, when I was last shopping uh, back to school clothes for my teenage son uh, in Maryland, we went to Gap, we went to Old Navy, we went to Target. And the stuff we bought was made in Indonesia, made in Pakistan, made in Bangladesh. There's one t-shirt made in Vietnam. I couldn't see anything that was made in India. So what gives? Um, it's um, a combination of rising wages in India. Um, and businesses here have not um, been, I think, entrepreneurial enough in the last five, seven years. There were opportunities abroad that could have been seized, but uh, they weren't. But I think that that is going to change now. I think you're going to see a sea change in, in that area. What makes it change? I think there's a very proactive approach now from the government to support those businesses, to support uh, medium-scale businesses. There's also been a huge push to support startup businesses. Yes. I think that we were a startup once upon a time. I think that every startup needs to be given a chance. Uh, I think in the last 10 years, there hasn't been much focus on startup. But as of the last two years, uh, there has been a huge focus on startup India. And I think that the biggest asset that the country has is its entrepreneurs and the quality of its entrepreneurs. And once those entrepreneurs are given a chance to do what they want, that's fun was a startup once upon a time. Fabinia was a startup. Um, they, will, they will flourish. I have no doubt about that. But they need an ecosystem that rewards them, that protects them, that nurtures them. And I think that ecosystem has come. Okay. So in the midst of this scaling up, in the midst of this entrepreneurial drive, Neelam, how do you ensure the sort of things that you said were important? Yeah. Before I come to that, I want to answer your question to 
William, you went to back to school. Yeah? I was with Lian Fung yesterday, and he was saying that India actually cannot compete in the sort of fitness and uh, areas where you need a lot of synthetic textile Man, because we are not allowed to import that in. Yeah. So that so you went to that particular all the stores looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it wasn't deliberate, I sure. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, but yeah. there is an issue there which we need to discuss. Yeah, and we'll come back to that later. So that's a piece of the market India is completely Man, missing fiber. out on. For some kind of, uh, I mean, of, uh, for some reasons. Other point, Anita Dongre's opened a store in New Soho, York. right? I completely endorse what uh, 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 William has said. Uh, the future is going to be on India's ability to build its global brands. China has been going, sort of uh, tearing its hair out because it actually hasn't got very strong consumer facing global brands yeah and they did a little uh, 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 soul searching lian fung organized this global conference four five years ago they got called a lot of thought leaders into the room and they said why are we not able to do this india is doing it it's got its startups it's got whatever you know tons of them and they said you know and they analyzed and then backwards and backwards and backwards and they came up with the fact that they had killed their culture they have completely, they have completely killed their cultural traditions because of the cultural revolution. Unfortunately, they've got one tiny corner of China which is still practicing some crafts. So there is actually a huge endeavor in China today to resurrect some of its heritage. Yeah. So inclusion, heritage, all that we have, we and the startup thing is completely right. A lot of startups will do it. And uh, a lot of, I would say, but startups need ecosystems, right? And we have fractured ecosystems. I mean, I'm a great proponent of the private sector. We are where we are because of private sector in the country. But if you're expecting private sector to go to the remotest of the villages and set up stuff, it, it's, it's not going to be competitive for them. They have to compete with South Asia, China, the world. So it depends on a whole lot of us, right? Corporate, CSR the government, civil society, and I here give the example of Amul, and then I'll stop. So Amul, <laughs> India's largest dairy cooperative, $4 billion in the world, a global brand, who owns it? Farmers. $4 billion, 84% goes down to the farmers. 16%, and it's one of the world's best managed companies. So we are in the position we, we should start looking at building out an amul of creative manufacturing. That's my mission in life. It's my goal. And it has to be done together. Yeah? William has to give the market access to it. So do they. Yeah? But we will build out the ecosystem for them. We can do it. Right? You know, we heard a lot yesterday in the manufacturing session yeah. about global supply chains, global quality chains. In fact, I think if I had 500 rupees for every time Mr. Kant mentioned those phrases, I could retire. But Dupali, you look like you're dying to jump in there. What do global supply chains mean for you? And is it true that India is not really part of them? Um, you know, I'll take it from Neelam, you know, when she started and talked about the farmers. I think uh, the important aspect, which I'll start off, is about cotton, for, because for us, uh, 60% of our product or 70% of our product is cotton. You talk about United States of America, they have USDA, they have classification of cotton that is done there. In India, you know, if the farmers get the best practices, and yeah, there is a thing called, we have created a better cotton. If they have a crop app, you know, which can support, they complete, you know, you know and that's where digitization can step into the grassroots that you have a crop app supporting them, what is the kind of crop they need to grow, what is the seed support that they need, and cut down the middleman for them. I think that's where the best practice and the fair practices will come in. And I, and I you know, if, if you talk about the position of India in the terms of cotton, cotton, you know, India uh, sub, uh, exports the maximum, it's the largest exporter of cotton and the second producer, uh, second largest producer of cotton in this, in, in this world. I think, and there's a lot to be done. So when you talk about the corporates and you talk about the farmer, I think that's fair because you have billionaires and millionaires in the United States of America who are farmers. Can we make that opportunity here, create those kind of corporates here for the farmers so they get a support system and ecosystem? And I think that, that's where your supply chain starts off and begins. And 
and I think that that's where because primarily if you talk about our country, we we are uh, an agricultural country, as our honourable minister said, but we are ironically dependent on monsoons for water. So so. And when I talk about businesses like us, can we create PPPs, where we did at Wells Fund. We, we recycle around 13 million liters of water every day. And we use that recycled water for our manufacturing so that the farmer has the water for irrigation and there's portable water for the communities around there. So I think that's where I think we, I would say that, interestingly enough, I think we can say a lot of changes that the government needs to make, but a lot of changes we as businesses will need to make. And we will need to become the agents of change here. William, what do you got? William is pondering a disconnected world. He was telling us at the start he's taking himself off LinkedIn, he's taking himself off other forms of social media. Is that really, is the object of that exercise so you can think more about global supply chains and global problems? <laughs> The and getting your that. stuff into Target, getting it into Gap, getting it into Old Navy. The object of that is really to cut some of the static in our lives because you're at the end of the day, your brain feels like it's been fried. You have too many inputs coming in from all over. And uh, as I grow older, I realize my brain needs some rest. So that's the object of that exercise. I do feel that um, uh, a lot of the structures that uh, globally have evolved um, certainly in the last 50, 60 years, are not really applicable to India. I mean, for example, if you take exports, most people use the example you've used. Um, I think exporting a t-shirt out of India at $2, which pollutes the water, which damages the rivers, which provides hardly any employment at a, at a wage that is so low that the guy can't, I don't particularly think that that's a great thing. Now, I know I'm going against, um, economic wisdom when I say that, but I really don't think that we should be, we should be exporting something like this, which creates each piece is two man days. So if you buy this for your son, you've created two days of meaningful labor for someone who has a skill, not someone who's sitting on at the edge of some machine, you know, cranking it out and being paid, you know, 8,200 rupees a month where, where he can barely send money home to his family in the village. I, mean, I, I know that economies in Southeast Asian so-called tigers have taken that route, but I think the time has come for India to take a different route. And we should actually look at what we have as assets in the country and develop along those assets, which is why I think Anita Dongri going to the Western opening is a great thing, because we have some of the greatest brands in the country that are being incubated. If they could get some help going abroad, they could really rival all the Italian and French brands put together. This is my belief. So instead of high fashion and luxury and quality being some Italian or French brand, it should be an Indian brand. So we have some of the greatest talent here. And, and I think that talent needs a leg up. And I think one of the things that is happening in the last two years is the government is committed to giving that support to entrepreneurs, and, and in this case, the great design talent of India. You know, it's been a while since I've heard the words economic and wisdom in the same sentence. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, Minister, we'll come back to you now, and then I think we want to allow time for some questions from the audience. One of the constant themes in the past 20 minutes has been government support, support from the government. In practical terms, your daily schedule, what does it mean for you? Well, um, I think that if you take the... Um, as we call it in Hindi, the sar, the crux of what everybody has said here. At one end, we have an apparel big package given so that we can scale up employability opportunities for our manufacturing sector. We have ensured that capital subsidy for sunrise sectors like technical textiles, medical textiles, the capital subsidy goes up to 25%. But at the same time, we recognize what Neelam is saying, that we have a legacy we can leverage in the world market, how do you decentralize financial support for weavers and artisans so that you can make them more productive right where they are with no desire to migrate? And I'm happy to share that uh, from the 7th to the 17th, we have around 800 clusters in our country of weavers and artisans. The government for the first time is going to the doorstep of that weaver, 
we are going to a 401 clusters ourselves with 15 national banks and we are telling the banks in every district, over 220 districts, that when the Viva and Artisan walks up to you, we will give them enough aid, a loan called Mudra, which the Honorable Prime Minister started, with no collateral. And we have seen that the poorest of the poor are better at returning bank loans. Uh, we have seen that when weavers get that bank loan and that support, their incomes have gone up by 60% in the first month itself. Uh, the fact that we can leverage the diversity in the Indian textile industry from an international perspective, give a t-shirt, but at the same time, give a handcrafted product that people who are connoisseurs of legacy and handcrafted goods can enjoy. So I think that is a delicate balance that the Indian textile industry has currently managed to maintain. And as a minister, I'm hoping I can't have a stepmotherly treatment to apparel and synthetics. I have to push it out and say that we'll give equal opportunity, equal financial support, including inclusive uh, growth, what Neelam spoke about. We have a power loom sector today, which employs a lot of people, which is absolutely, it's like a dichotomy in our sector today. It is absolutely at loggerheads with the handcrafted goods, but it does employ millions of people in our country. And we have said for the first time that if we want to have sustainable growth, as William spoke about, uh, we are helping them with renewable energy and the capital subsidy support that we are giving them is 50%. But if they are from marginalized communities, then they get 75% off on any renewable capacity that they want to for their looms. But if they are from a tribal community and it's an entrepreneur from a tribal community, they get 90% off. Now that kind of support in this sector is absolutely unheard of. So the government has prepared those structures, reaching out to those clusters, be it power loom, be it hand loom. And Mr. Bissell is getting off LinkedIn, but we are a young country, so we are having hashtags, <laughs> and people are rediscovering hand looms and rushing back to every store where they can get that hand loom. Yes. So, so let's have technology. hashtag audience questions. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and if folks could identify themselves, please. My name is Harsha Subramani from Bloomberg. Uh, I just want to link up, link what this entire conversation with what's going on in the broader economy. And one of the concerns that the economy has broadly is private sector industry is not spending enough. Uh, could you tell us your view on what the textile industry is doing to spend and kickstart the investment cycle? Uh, and, and if you're able to see foreign in investor interest as well. By the way, that was uh, not a planted question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm happy to share that FDI in textiles has gone up three times uh, in the past one and a half, two years. That in itself, uh, I think, uh, resonates in some way or the other, the confidence that the foreign investors have in the potential of our sector to grow. Secondly, I can speak for the textile industry. I see them actually breaking new uh, frontiers. For instance, uh, Wellspun was primarily known for providing towels and made-ups. <laughs> But they also now, when I visited their plant, have a medical textile unit which is coming up. And more and more people now are kind of branching out. So on one end, I have a made up which takes local craftspersons and makes them embroidered on a kushakrabo. At the same time, the same unit have, will have another part which is making medical textiles. Similarly, we have uh, you know an initiative, let's say, where a weaver would uh, work towards getting a handloom mark uh, understanding GI because we have now around 28 weaver service centers across the country and we said for somebody to understand the potency of uh, having their pa patents registered they need to get that legal advice which is expensive for poor artisans and weavers but the government provides it free and that is where the traction is happening we are seeing more and more e-commerce businesses springing up in the handloom and handcraft sector so for me the future is wide open as Tom Petty uh, bless his soul has the said, light. Great. but, but uh, I think that that is the uh, thing that excites industry, that uh, textile gives you and helps you leverage your investment across many such crafts, across many such opportunities. So from a towel to a Diwali gift, uh, from a bed sheet to a medical supply, we cover it all, including the uh, ISRO satellites which are going up. <laughs> 
And something tells me, like Tom Petty, you won't back down either. No. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? So. I am um, Cholia Bandara, Global Shaper from Sri Lanka. I work for MA Soldings, which is the second largest vendor to Nike. So we import a lot of fabric, synthetic fabric from Taiwan and China. I just want to know any strategy you have in mind to uh, promote synthetic fabric manufacturing in India because then we can easily source from a nearby country than getting it from um, Far East. We are more than happy to welcome your business. And <laughs> I will say this, that the Pali had spoken about cotton and the gentleman here speaks about synthetics. The challenge in textiles is that cotton falls under the ambit of the agriculture ministry and synthetics falls under the ambit of another ministry. So the Prime Minister speaks not only about cooperative federalism, but also talks about his own ministries working in close tandem. So when we had the Textiles India 2017 uh, initiative, we had many representatives from Sri Lanka, from Bangladesh, and they all said the same thing. Can we uh, kind of collaborate and start sourcing our raw material from India? And for the first time, the government the industry and there was an interministerial group which has been constituted as to how to leverage our potential in MMF, how to make rates much more competitive and I think you will hear good news very very soon. Uh, but uh, I will also say from the cotton perspective, Dibali is absolutely right, uh, farmers were never taught that a better grade of cotton that they're already producing will get them a better price. And because classification as an educative tool was not very popular, many people did not even know that by picking that cotton by hand, they're actually contaminating their own wear and bringing their own prices down. So the government has started an initiative. We've done a test case uh, with around 500 farmers where we've given them implements which actually without manually picking the cotton, it's a very small implement for 3,000 bucks. And we've said you can suck that cotton in, bag it without touching it, and then have it uh, sold in the market. We're also leveraging technology. The Prime Minister says that one of the biggest challenges for the farmer is to get that good price right after sale. Most of them would give it to the middleman who would go to the market and then sell. We now are uh, in, con in conjunction with all state governments. We have said that the nearest market or the ginning mill for the farmer becomes that yard for the farmer to sell. And all the money now will be electronically transferred to the farmer, which is a first such huge initiative in the country, where you identify that farmer through the DBT route, through the other route, electronically pass on the money. So a happy farmer is a better textile industry. <laughs> you just mentioned technology. Now, Dupali, something tells me you're going to talk about blockchain here. Go ahead. Um, so when you, um, you know, it again gets back to my point when you said, what is the reason of having textiles in India? And that, that's hurting me more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, um, apart from, uh, you know, employing maximum people and uh, the workforce in India, I mean, uh, 35 million workforce in this country and going bigger than that, if you, even if you're talking about the gender diversity, which is around 50% not employed. So uh, when you talk about technology, um, uh, for us, uh, I think the blockchain has been an inter interesting part where you can trace back, uh, you have a QR code on a product, you can trace it back to the whole uh, bale and from which farm that has come in from. And I think it's a very powerful medium because when you're talking about the generation that you're talking, you know, you have the millennials who are going to be, uh, you know, wanting to know the source from where their product is coming in from or, you know, uh, what is the sustainability that, you know, that product talks about. I think that's where the blockchain really is something that uh, we, we have got a patent for that, uh, in, you know, initiative which traces it back from cradle to uh, the point of sales. It's 10 o'clock. We are going to try to finish on time. Are there any more questions from the audience? So try to keep it brief, please. Um, I'm Jacob. I'm with uh, Creative Villain. Um, Stand Up India is to look at uh, people, micro entrepreneurs who are already in business. And textile is full of micro entrepreneurs. Uh, my question is really what's being done to promote entrepreneurship and not just uh, you know, access to power, access to material? I think if you want to promote entrepreneurship, one of the first challenges that a new entrepreneur faces is those very questions. Uh, they come to me and they say, well, I have this great idea. 
I'm a design thinker, but I don't know how to get enough capital to support my needs to start a unit. So how do you start a unit? You need machinery. And they said, how do I get a subsidy to ensure that I get the machinery? Now, when you talk about uh, startups or new entrepreneurs, the beauty of textiles is that when you look at the textile machinery part of it, which again is not a part of the mandate of the textile ministry, we as a nation for close to 30 years now have used all our subsidy money to get secondhand machines from China. Yes. And indigenously not produced enough machinery so that our companies can have a higher speed uh, in terms of productivity which is an anomaly, it's an oxymoron for a country of engineers. Uh, our textile machinery is coming secondhand from another country. So when I talk to people about starting up and becoming entrepreneurs, I want the engineers to also come in and look at that aspect of textile, which, because a weaver's craft is something which is a legacy issue passed from one generation to another. So when, let's say, I address myself to a weaver community, then I have youngsters saying, I don't want to do this work anymore because for me it's not cool enough. So how does an entrepreneur start there? We introduce technology from a design perspective. We tell the weaver's child that, okay, whatever you saw your parents make on a loom, what if you try and make that design? Because making that design for the loom takes days. I said, what if you have a computer and you make the design yourself? They feel empowered. And I said, if I give you the soft skills to, let's say, learn English, present yourself when a tourist comes, and you can not only sell that wear, you become a tourist destination unto <coughs> yourself. So those are the changes. Because just to say that one stand-up and one startup, from my perspective, is enough to put a person in that silo actually would be doing a lot of disservice to the complexity of the textile industry. And I must say here, Dan, that when you talk about inclusivity, textiles and especially the apparel sector, 70% of the employees are women. And uh, today, when you talk about jobs, we have a skilling uh, program with the industry where we um, handhold the person that the industry engages. We pay the industry to skill up and scale up. And we have seen today that the textile industry placement record is close to 72%. And when we, are, when we talk about giving that job, it doesn't mean that you get a job today and the government says, OK, well done, and leaves. We actually call that employee six months down the line. And we check whether the employee is retained by their organization. Because that six months duration is enough for the employee to assess uh, what they are doing in that particular structure and for the employer to know whether they'd like to retain that person. So that is the extent of the government's engagement uh, uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective. So even if a new entrepreneur comes up and says, I want to skill workers, I have somebody with legacy uh, you know, talent, but they need to be marketable, we actually help in that as well. Minister, panelists, thank you. You know, we may just about have answered the question, why is India still in textiles? <laughs> thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. Thank you.